Welcome to Live FAQ, where we talk to real experts answering your questions in real time. I'm really excited to have today joining me Mary Shawman, uh, who is a thyroid patient advocate and the author of several books on the topic of thyroid and hormone. And, uh, I, you know, I personally am excited about this topic. So, uh, welcome to Live FAQ, Mary. Thanks, Cheryl. It's really great to be on. Welcome. So um, you can learn a whole lot about Mary at thyroid-info.com and I'll also add the link later on in the description. But um, we're here to add, answer and ask the frequently asked questions, uh, the top 20 right now, and Mary will be back to answer even more. But um, Mary, can you talk about kind of how you, know, how you are first approached with uh, people when they come to you and how you came up with with these questions sure well I get hundreds and hundreds of emails every week I have a very active Facebook page with you know, thousands of folks I get uh, phone calls in the middle of the night sometimes from people and there are a lot of folks who have a lot of questions about thyroid disease so what I did was I put together the top 20 questions that I was getting regularly, the ones that people just keep asking over and over again uh, over the past 15 years that I've been working as a patient advocate for thyroid patients. Wow, so, uh, and that's fantastic. So, uh, let's get started. So the first question, uh, I think, you know, it seems simple, but, you know, to a lot of people it is kind of the critical question. What is the thyroid and, and what does it do? Well, your thyroid is a very small gland. It's shaped like a bow tie or a butterfly. I'm actually, I'll show you, I'm wearing my, my butterfly necklace tonight, uh, today, so that I can uh, show you where, uh, generally where the thyroid is located. Uh, but it's shaped like a butterfly. Some people describe it as a, a little bow tie, but it's located behind uh, and the Adam's apple area and in the neck. Uh, and it's very small. It only weighs about an ounce normally. So it's a very tiny gland, but it's a very powerful gland because your thyroid is your master gland of metabolism. Its job is to produce the hormones that deliver oxygen and energy to every single cell, organ, tissue, and gland in your body. So it's an extremely important uh, little tiny powerhouse. It's really your metabolic engine for your body. And so these hormones help with our metabolism. They help deliver that oxygen and energy to the body. And everything that happens in your body physiologically relies on your thyroid. So if your hair is growing, if your skin uh, is growing, digestion, uh, thinking, your heart function, muscle function, digestion, constipation, the, your, everything from your top of your head, the hair on your head, to your fingernails and toenails are reliant on your thyroid. But the most important parts are the heart, the head, the brain, the hormones, and all of the key organs that we need for survival. They all rely on the thyroid to deliver oxygen and energy. Wow. So, you know, we we hear a lot about um, the types of uh, thyroid issues. Um, so the first one is, what is hypothyroidism? Hypothyroidism is underactive thyroid, or a thyroid that has slowed down. So sometimes you'll hear the description, slow thyroid, or low thyroid, or underactive thyroid, but all of those are the same as hypothyroidism, an underfunctioning or slowed down thyroid gland. And what happens with hypothyroidism is the thyroid is not producing that hormone. So that crucial hormone we're talking about that delivers the oxygen and energy, not enough of it is being produced by the gland itself. And so when we are hypothyroid, everything slows down. So we can have slow digestion, slow thinking, slow pulse. Our body temperature can drop. We can gain weight. We can be fuzzy uh, thinking. Memory can fail. Our hair may fall out. So anything in the body that is supposed to be moving at normal speed can slow down to a glacial pace. Wow. Those are some really kind of obvious uh, symptoms. What are the other uh, symptoms of an underactive uh, thyroid or hypothyroidism? Well, there are a number of different really critical symptoms of hypothyroidism that people want to be aware of. 
probably the big three are weight gain or uh, the inability to lose weight despite a really good diet and exercise program. Uh, so that's one of the most common complaints and symptoms. Another very common symptom is depression or feeling moody or get, having the blues. So if you feel off and you're feeling kind of depressed but there's no reason to be depressed or there's not some sort of major stress going on in your life, that can be a sign of hypothyroidism. But probably the big daddy of all of the symptoms for a lot of folks is fatigue. It's really exhausting. Uh, in some cases, you're not even sleeping well, but when you wake up, you're even more tired, or maybe you're getting 8, 10, 12 hours of sleep a night, and you're still waking up exhausted. Exhaustion to the point that some people have described to me that they're going out to their cars at lunchtime at their job and taking a nap just to function for the rest of the day. Or they come home, they're supposed to make dinner for their family, and they have to lay on the couch for 30 minutes just to get their energy together to make dinner. So we're talking about a really extreme kind of fatigue. Because people will say, oh, I'm tired, everybody's tired. Right. But we're talking about really extreme exhaustion that can really throw off your life and really be debilitating. Some of the other common symptoms of hypothyroidism are feeling cold all the time. So if you're putting on a sweater when everyone else is fanning themselves because it's so hot, that can be a sign that you're hypothyroid. Uh, hair loss. And in particular, hair loss from the outer edge of the eyebrows. So if you're penciling in your eyebrows when you're doing your makeup, that can be a sign that you're hypothyroid. Uh, in some cases, people will be very puffy, in particular around the under eye and eyelid area, the hands and the feet. So they, if you have swelling or what's known as edema, but puffiness, that can be a, a, a symptom of hypothyroidism. A lot of folks complain of aches and pains, so muscular aches, muscle pains. Uh, in particular, thyroid patients are much more susceptible to carpal uh, tunnel syndrome and tarsal t uh, tunnel syndrome and tendinitis in the arms and the legs. So if you have carpal tunnel, one of the first things you want to do is get your thyroid checked. Uh, tinnitus, uh, some people call it tinnitus, the ringing in the ear, this can be a symptom of a thyroid imbalance as well. There's a whole host of symptoms for women uh, that can affect us. We can have difficulty getting pregnant. We can have recurrent early miscarriages. Uh, we can also have difficulty breastfeeding. Uh, so these are common uh, signs of thyroid in women, uh, particularly. Women can also have erratic menstrual periods or uh, difficulty with um, their menstrual periods in terms of the flow or the intensity or the pain level, so, or extreme PMS as well. Uh, sex drive can drop for both men and women. That's a very common thyroid symptom as well. Uh, some people will complain about heart palpitations or a very slow heartbeat or very slow and low blood pressure or in some cases they have the opposite problem. So when they become hypothyroid, they'll have very high blood pressure and very high heart rate. Um, so it's kind of a, a double-edged sword there. Uh, some people have fullness in the neck or they can't tolerate a scarf or a tie or a turtleneck. Or they may feel hoarse, their voice may sound very scratchy. Some women have reported to me, everybody thinks I'm a man on the phone. Uh, so, and that was the sign that they had a thyroid problem. So those are sort of, uh, that's sort of a, a good overview of the list, but there are probably a hundred symptoms that really fall into the hypothyroid category, but that touches on some of the key ones. Wow. This is, you know, an amazing a little, uh, <laughs> a little thing this thyroid is. That is an amazing list. So um, in, in contrast to hypothyroidism, what is then hyperthyroidism? Sure. Hyperthyroidism is a situation where the thyroid gland is producing way too much hormone. So while hypothyroid means you're not, you don't have enough hormone and everything slows down, in hyperthyroidism, it's like you put your foot on the gas pedal and it's gotten stuck. Wow. So the body is flooded with thyroid hormone, which means that we are getting too much oxygen and energy to all the cells and tissues and organs and glands in the body. So what happens is everything speeds up. Heart rate can go up, blood pressure can go up, body temperature can go up, which means you can feel hot. So these are the people that are walking around in tank tops when it's freezing out because they're so hot they can't understand why. Uh, some people even have uh, hot flashes. They may think they're in menopause, but it can be a thyroid problem going haywire. Uh, 
another sign of hyperthyroidism can be rapid weight loss. And some people say, hey, give me a, give me a case of hyperthyroidism. That sounds good to me. But this is debilitating weight loss. This is the kind of weight loss that comes with a really bad price because you lose muscle, you're exhausted, you're debilitated, and you know the flesh just hangs off of you. A lot of people end up looking like they're in end-stage uh, chronic uh, uh, terminal illness when they've had a, a long bout of, of hyperthyroidism. That People have even been misdiagnosed as having uh, anorexia or bulimia or eating disorders or even drug problems when they actually had an under an overactive thyroid that hadn't been properly diagnosed and treated. Um, other symptoms can be anxiety. People can even have panic attacks or be told that they have a panic disorder because the symptoms can be very similar. Uh, people will find sometimes that they have a tough time sleeping, so insomnia is very common. Uh, even tremor in the hands. Uh, is a is a common symptom easily startled um, sometimes people with hyperthyroidism will notice that their eyes become scratchy or dry or they may have a bit of a bug-eyed or protruding eye uh, type of uh, view of their eyes if you look at their eyes you might it might look like they have a stare or they're not blinking as much that's something called lid lag uh, where the lids just aren't working as quickly as they should uh, in the thyroid uh, some of the other symptoms can be extremely dry skin, the hair can get brittle, sometimes women will find that they have almost no menstrual period at all or it stops or it, or it becomes very light and unusual. And people can have muscle weakness, in particular the muscle in their legs and in their upper arms. And I've heard so many patients describe that the first sign that, they're, that their thyroid was becoming overactive was that they had such a tough time going up and down stairs. All of a sudden it was like dragging lead weights. Uh, another common description is women in particular saying, you know, I would be brushing my hair and have my arm up over my head and I had to prop my arm up because it got so tired in one minute just trying to brush my hair. So that kind of muscle weakness and achiness in the arms and the legs is characteristic of hyperthyroidism. Uh, people can also have very fast digestion, so they may have diarrhea or very frequent uh, loose bowel movements as well. That's very common with uh, hyperthyroidism. So everything is speeding up. People can feel anxious, nervous, stressed out, buzzing, heart rates up, blood pressures up, metabolism is, is raging. They may feel incredibly hungry and thirsty all the time, but not even be uh, gaining weight, but actually still losing weight. They may even feel the need to be moving all the time. Some people who are hyperthyroid start exercising intensively because they just can't uh, sit still. So there's a lot of interesting symptoms that come with hyperthyroidism. And so we've touched on some of them here. And again, there's a whole long list, uh, probably a hundred different symptoms that are, that are common and characteristic, but we've touched on some of the most common ones. Wow. Yeah, you know, we actually, uh, my older brother, uh, a few years back, I had the hand tremors and the eye you know, kind of bulging thing. We were, you know, we usually only get together once or twice a year at the time, and you know, we were all really worried. And that's it turned out that he uh, had hyperthyroidism. So, yes. Uh, it, it really does kind of have multiple uh, symptoms. So uh, the other thing I think uh, the next question and the other thing I think people are concerned about was what is a goiter? Well, a goiter is a terminology that refers to to an enlarged thyroid gland. So we talked about the fact that a thyroid is shaped like a butterfly. It's a, a usually one ounce when it's a normal size, but when there is some form of thyroid disease or inflammation going on with the thyroid, the thyroid can start to enlarge, sometimes to several times its normal size. And when it enlarges, that's referred to as a goiter. And this can be seen in autoimmune Hashimoto's disease, which is the autoimmune condition that typically causes people to become hypothyroid. It can happen in Graves' disease or hyperthyroidism as well. And in some cases, if you are iodine deficient, it can happen. And we also can see uh, a goiter develop in people who have uh, nodules or lumps in their thyroids. So it's inflaming the thyroid, so the thyroid gland can become extremely enlarged. So there's a variety of reasons why the thyroid can become enlarged like that. And some of the symptoms can be um, 
absolutely a visual because some people will actually be able to see it by looking right in the mirror. Uh, their neck will become enlarged or they'll see a lumpiness around their neck uh, and other people may notice it as well. So it can be a cosmetically detectable issue. But in some cases the goiter may not be large enough to be seen visibly, but it may be big enough to start affecting your swallowing or your breathing or give you a feeling of discomfort in your neck or again make you feel uncomfortable with neckties, scarves, turtlenecks, things around your neck. Right. Wow. So um, the next question is, and this you know term has been going around, um, this term has been going around quite some time, and it is the autoimmune thyroid disease. Can you talk about what that is? Yes. Well, when we talk about hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism, those are conditions. Those aren't diseases unto themselves. But for the majority of people, certainly in the United States, the cause of these thyroid conditions is autoimmune thyroid disease. And by autoimmune, what we're talking about is a when the body decides to attack its own glands, organs, cells, or tissues. So we're not quite sure what exactly turns this process on, and there's a lot of study going on with this, but what we know is that the body decides that something that's normally supposed to be there, like the thyroid gland, is suddenly a foreign invader. And so it produces antibodies to attack and in some cases destroy the gland itself. And so some people refer to it as friendly fire disease when you have an autoimmune disease because your body's immune system is normally meant to fight off viruses and bacteria and pathogens and illnesses of all sorts. It's not meant to fight off your own glands and organs. But in this case, something goes awry and the body decides to attack uh, its own thyroid gland. And thyroid is, thyroid, autoimmune thyroid disease is only one of about 80 different autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, pernicious anemia, multiple sclerosis, uh, type 1 diabetes, these are all the different uh, diseases that are in that category. But in the autoimmune thyroid category, there's two key diseases. There is Hashimoto's disease, which is named after a Japanese researcher. And in Hashimoto's, the body produces antibodies that attack the thyroid gland and gradually chip away at its ability to function. And often, oftentimes it causes atrophy or shrinking of the gland and eventually it can cause the gland to become completely unfunctional, non-functional, where the gland shrinks, shrivels up, and basically does uh, is unable to do anything that it's supposed to. It becomes incapable of producing thyroid hormone. And this can be a very slow process, though. So it doesn't happen in a week or two. It can happen over years or even decades. Uh, the opposite problem is Graves' disease. And this is the autoimmune disease where the antibodies attack the thyroid and make it overactive. So these antibodies attach themselves to the thyroid and cause it to overproduce. And so Graves' disease is far less common than Hashimoto's. Hashimoto's is a much more common and is actually one of the most common autoimmune diseases in the United States, whereas Graves' is less common. But those are the two key autoimmune diseases that affect the thyroid and that cause hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. Wow. Now, are there any key risk factors to um, thyroid disease? Yeah, there are a number of key risk factors. Uh, certainly, one of the first risk factors is gender. Uh, if you're a woman, you are at much higher risk of developing a thyroid condition than if you're a man. Uh, the estimates and statistics kind of vary depending on who you talk to, but anywhere from 7 to 10 times more likely for women to develop thyroid conditions than men. So the vast majority of thyroid patients diagnosed and those who are walking around with a condition that have yet to be diagnosed are women. But that doesn't mean men can't get it too. Uh, as, you, as you know with your brother uh, developing a thyroid condition, uh, that it, you know, it's not uncommon in men, but it just is much more prevalent in women. Uh, another factor is age. As we get older, we have a much greater risk of thyroid problems. So really, uh, in women, the thyroid conditions are become much more common after pregnancy and then during perimenopause. So once you hit 40 and above, that's when the risk goes up much higher. Uh, but by the age of 50, I think it was one in five women has some form of a thyroid condition. Uh, and by age 60, I think it's up to two in five. By age 70, I think it's one in five men. 
So as we get older, the thyroid tends to slow down, and we oftentimes will see uh, additional uh, evidence of, of slowdowns and issues. And also the, uh, the hyperthyroid Graves' disease can show up more likely in women during perimenopause and menopause as well. Uh, genetics are an issue as well. Uh, if you have a family member that has any autoimmune disease, so we're not just talking about the thyroid diseases, we're talking about any autoimmune disease at all. If you have a family member with that, and we're talking about really a first generation, second generation family, grandparent, parent, brother, sister, uh, child, grandchild, any of those kinds of categories, then you are at higher risk of developing any one of the autoimmune conditions. So it's not just thyroid that travels genetically, it's the autoimmune tendency that travels genetically. So somebody who's got a mother that has type 1 diabetes may uh, show up with Hashimoto's or someone who has uh, celiac disease uh, in their sister may have Graves' disease in themselves. So we need to be aware of the autoimmune history of our family members, but certainly if there are thyroid issues, if you're a woman, and your grandmother, your mother, your sister, or your daughter have thyroid conditions, then you're at a higher risk as well. So we look at genetics and heredity as a factor. So Cheryl, get your thyroid checked. I know. I'm thinking, you know, normally we don't, when we think of, uh, you know, family history, we don't think brother, sister, but you're right. <laughs> exactly. No, it's, it's very important, especially with thyroid. And with hyperthyroid, it's most likely your brother's hyperthyroidism was probably caused by Graves' disease. And that is something that, that genetically travels through the family. So you want to be double checking with all the family, kids, and grandparents, and everyone wants to make sure that they get their thyroid checked. Awesome. Well, then um, that, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say there are a couple of other key risk factors as well for thyroid. Uh, cigarette smoking. Uh, there are some chemicals in cigarettes, in particular thiocyanate, which can really damage the thyroid. So it's a known risk factor for thyroid issues both hypo and hyper, and in patients who have Graves' disease, some patients develop the eye problems that we were talking about where the eyes get uh, protruding and they have uh, vision disturbances, and the treatments for those eye problems work far, uh, far less effectively in people who are smokers, and people who are smokers are much more likely to have the eye problems with their thyroid. So uh, a good, another good reason to, to stop smoking for people who are smokers, but it's, it's also important to know that it's a risk factor. Uh, another risk factor is recent pregnancy or miscarriage. So if a woman has just had a miscarriage or has lost a baby or she's just delivered a baby, uh, she is at much higher risk during that period of the nine months to a year afterwards of developing a thyroid condition. So it's a time when women want to pay particular attention to their symptoms. And it can be confusing because fatigue, hair loss, uh, weight issues, tiredness, depression, these are all common after a miscarriage or even after having a baby. So some people get them mixed up and they don't always realize it's their thyroid. Uh, we also know that overconsumption of the goitrogenic foods, these are the cruciferous vegetables and brassica family vegetables like kale, spinach, Brussels sprouts, uh, broccoli, uh, cabbage. If you eat too much of them in a raw state, so you, if you cook them or steam them, that gets rid of most of the goitrogenic or anti-thyroid potential. But if you eat them raw, or in particular, if you juice them where you're putting huge quantities of veggies into a juicer and, and coming out with a glass of juice, you can actually be, you think you're doing something healthy for yourself, and you can actually be slowing your thyroid down dramatically. Wow. So you want to be careful. We also need to be careful about soy. Uh, a little bit of soy as a fermented food can be a healthy part of your diet. But a lot of people go soy crazy. So it's soy smoothies, soy milk, soy lattes, edamame, soy burgers, soy bars, soy powders, protein shakes, the whole bit. And they go, they go so crazy that they're turning soy from a food into a drug. Because soy is a phytoestrogen. And at higher levels, it starts to block the body's ability to absorb thyroid hormone. So we need to be careful about overconsumption of soy and certainly staying away from the processed GMO soy and the soys that are not in their natural fermented forms. Uh, and then x-ray radiation, uh, if you've had a lot of dental x-rays or x-ray treatments to the neck or radiation treatments, Hodgkin's lymphoma patients have had a lot of neck radiation, uh, you're at a higher risk of thyroid issues. Also radiation exposure due to nuclear accidents. 
So our folks that were downwind of Chernobyl back in 86 and the poor folks uh, who were exposed to Fukushima in Japan a few years back are at a higher risk of developing thyroid conditions. Uh, and then um, finally, the last uh, area is really toxic exposures. Uh, there are a variety of toxins, everything from the old Teflon uh, coatings to in pans to perchlorate that's contaminating our water supply, uh, fluoride that's in the water supply, uh, certain kinds of pesticides used to fight West Nile virus, certain types of chemicals used to put Scotch Guard on fabrics and carpets. These are all uh, environmental estrogens and, and environmental toxins uh, called endocrine disruptors that can affect your thyroid in a negative way. So these are all the risk factors and there's actually there's more risk factors but we've kind of touched on I think the key list here. Wow. You know, that's a really big list. And, and when we talked about the, the risk factors as well as some of the uh, symptoms, some of those are really common symptoms to other things. Like you said, sometimes, you know, depression and low energy level can be from, you know, some, some of those things happening, giving birth, having a miscarriage. How do you find out if you have a thyroid condition? Well, there are a number of ways that, uh, that we can get to the bottom of this with our doctors. Uh, and first thing is, uh, certainly one of the, the key steps is blood tests. And one of the confusing issues here is that a lot of doctors rely on simply one test, which is called a TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone test. This is measuring a pituitary hormone, and it, the pituitary gland is communicating with the thyroid and telling it to slow down or speed up in terms of its hormone production. Uh, but there are other tests including the free T4 and free T3, uh, the thyroid antibodies panels, and reverse T3 that can help get a much better picture of what's really going on with the thyroid at least at a blood uh, test level. This gives us a picture of what's happening in the blood itself. But there are other things that are part of a thorough evaluation of the thyroid. First of all, a, a good thyroid examination is going to include a medical history. So we want that doctor to be asking you, do you have family members who've had thyroid problems? Do you have family members with autoimmune disease? Have you had that radiation uh, treatment to your neck or have you had a lot of dental work with a lot of dental x-rays? So we're going to get that kind of a history that's really going to be able to ferret out whether or not something's going on with the thyroid or there's a family or personal history of past thyroid problems. This is particularly an issue for older folks because some of them actually had thyroid treatment when they were young. So I've talked with so many women in their 20s after they had a baby they had a thyroid problem or went on treatment. Eventually they went off of it, they were doing okay, but then they're 65 or 70 and all of a sudden it's come back again. And the doctor said, well, did you ever get treated for glandular problems? And they're, they're, they're saying, yeah, wait a minute, I did. And they remember. So a really good thorough history with an examination of the, uh, the clinical factors as well is critical. And what, we're, what they're going to be doing there is a hands-on examination. So they're going to actually feel your thyroid. They're going to put their hand on your neck. They're going to palpate and feel around. They're looking for lumps, enlargements, or irregularities in the shape and position of the thyroid and feeling for any kinds of lumps or bumps or nodules. Uh, they also typically do a uh, reflex test because slow reflexes can be a symptom of hypothyroidism and super fast or startled uh, reflexes can be a symptom of hyperthyroidism. They'll check your heart rate and your blood pressure uh, to see whether it's either slow or fast or whether there's any irregular heart patterns that may point to some sort of a thyroid irregularity. They'll oftentimes uh, look, they'll also use a stethoscope to listen to the thyroid because they want to see if there's increased blood flow and they can hear if there's increased blood flow which can sometimes be a sign that something's going on. Uh, they also are going to look at your hair and your skin because that's going to give them some, some good signs. In particular for hyperthyroid patients, some of them end up with such fast turnover in their skin cells that they have an almost unusually velvety uh, look to their skin. Uh, they can also, uh, th hypothyroid patients though may have uh, dryness, mottled skin, you can see this, the straw-like hair or the dry breaking hair, the coarseness of the hair, and hyperthyroid patients will also sometimes have unusual patches 
of uh, rashes on their shins. So they'll look for that. There's also some finger things that go on on the hands and the fingers in hyperthyroidism that a good clinical examination is going to be looking for. And of course, they're going to be looking at your eyes. Uh, in particular for the hyperthyroid and Graves' disease patients, they're going to be looking for signs that you have a protrusion of the eyeballs or you, that you have this lid lag issue where the lids are not completely closing. I mean, there's a variety of different things that they're going to be looking for in that clinical exam. So we want to see the clinical exam. We want them to do a good history. We want them to put hands on your thyroid. And in some cases, though, they may also need to do an imaging test. This can include a CAT scan, it could be a, an ultrasound, or it could be uh, something known as a radio iodine uptake test, where they give you a tracer dose of iodine, take an x-ray, and actually are looking at the thyroid on the x-ray to see what it's doing. Um, if there are thyroid nodules, which are, are quite common, uh, and they look suspicious, and there's a variety of characteristics that doctors are looking for to decide if they're suspicious, then another good way to determine if the thyroid nodule is cancerous or is benign, and the majority of them are benign but they need to be checked out, is to do a fine needle aspiration biopsy where they insert a needle into the nodule, withdraw some cells, and look at them uh, with a pathologist to rule out cancer or to make a diagnosis. So um, just kind of to, to uh, talk about the test that, that Mary mentioned, the TSH, the T4, uh, free T4, free T3, um, all of those, if you're watching on uh, live FAQ, you can hit the button that says order a test, or I'll make sure to put a link in the description so you can see where you can order those tests. Uh, and let me talk about how you can talk to Mary once you get your results. So, sure. Uh, great stuff. So, um, you know, we talked about diagnosis. How is hypothyroidism diagnosed? Well, it, it really depends on who you're talking to. Because if you're talking to a conventional doctor, uh, a lot of them are going to rely only on the thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH test. And this is a test that's measuring the hormone that's produced by the pituitary gland and it's a messenger hormone so its job is to go deliver uh, the message to the thyroid that it needs to speed up because there's not enough hormone being produced or it tells it to slow down because there's too much hormone being produced. Uh, so this test uh, is considered the gold standard by the conventional endocrinology world. However, uh, as many thyroid patients are learning the hard way, unfortunately, it does not pick up on all cases of thyroid disease and it doesn't pick up on certain types of thyroid issues. So there's a lot of controversy about this, but as a thyroid patient advocate, I feel like a comprehensive uh, thyroid diagnosis really requires several other tests. So in addition to the TSH test, I typically, uh, for myself and for the people that I am, am talking to, would suggest a free T4 that's also known as a free thyroxin test, and that's measuring the unbound and available amount of T4, which is one of the two key hormones that the thyroid produces. And T4 is the storage hormone. So we want to get a picture of how much of that stored hormone is available and circulating in your bloodstream. Now, T4 converts to T3 in the thyroid and the liver and in other peripheral tissues and T3 is the active hormone in the, in the bloodstream. So T3 is what carries the payload. It's what goes to the cells and delivers that oxygen and energy. So I also feel like it's very crucial to measure free T3. And T3 is the abbreviation for triiodothyronon. So big long word, easier to say free T3. Uh, and free T3, like I said, that's the active hormone. So that's uh, getting that picture gives us a sense of the available active thyroid hormone circulating around in your bloodstream. Uh, some people can have perfectly normal TSH, free T4, and free T3, but they also need to be checked for the thyroid peroxidase antibodies, also abbreviated as TPO. And TPO is most commonly elevated in people who have this Hashimoto's disease, which is the autoimmune disease that causes the thyroid to slow down. But the interesting part of that test is that long before the thyroid actually starts to register 
a uh, slowdown in the TSH, free T4, and free T3 tests, we can see the, uh, the uh, high antibodies, which can be chipping away and slowing down the thyroid step by step by step. So for some people, they may have perfectly normal blood test levels, but their antibody levels will be high, suggesting that they have some degree of Hashimoto's disease. And the reason that's valuable for us is that it tells us if the thyroid is in the process of self-destructing or failing. And by treating that type of thyroid condition with low doses of thyroid medication and other types of interventions with diet and lifestyle and anti-inflammatory sorts of approaches, we may be able to either uh, slow or halt the progression of the autoimmune disease and prevent progression. So, and then how, how does that differ from um, how hyperthyroidism is diagnosed? Well, hyperthyroidism is typically diagnosed uh, mainly on the blood test at this point. Uh, they're going to do the TSH test and they'll be looking for very low or undetectable levels of TSH. So the closer it gets to zero, the more hyperthyroid it may be. Uh, they're also going to look for very high or out of range free T4 and free T3 levels, which would indicate that they, uh, there are high levels of circulating hormone in the bloodstream. In some cases, uh, the radioactive uh, iodine uptake test is done to determine whether or not the thyroid might have nodules that are producing this extra hormone because in some cases there's a condition called toxic multinodular disease and where their nodules are developed and the nodules become like little mini thyroids unto themselves and they can produce lots and lots of extra hormone which can make someone very hyperthyroid. So sometimes they do that imaging test as well so they can take a a peek at what's going on with the thyroid gland, but the blood tests uh, are typically used. And then to to pick up on Graves' disease or the autoimmune uh, Graves' disease, they would also add in uh, various antibody tests, including the thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins or TSI tests, which can pick up on antibodies that attack the thyroid and make it overactive. Right. So, uh, are there any other ways to uh, diagnose Graves' disease? Well, with Graves, really. Uh, again, we want the free T4, free T3, TSH. We want that thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins. And again, in some cases, they may need to do imaging tests. Doctors might take a look with an ultrasound or a CAT scan, or if they really want to see whether the uh, thyroid's got lumps or bumps or pockets of overactivity, they're going to do a radioactive iodine uptake scan. Right. So that leads to the next question. You mentioned lumps or bumps. If, you know, the next question is, if I have a lump in my thyroid, is it cancer? Well, the good news is if you have a lump or a bump, uh, what's known as a nodule in your thyroid, uh, the odds are good that you don't have cancer. Uh, about 95% of thyroid nodules are benign. So uh, that's the good news. Um, but there are characteristics of thyroid nodules. If they are growing very quickly, if they become very large, those are higher risk nodules. Also nodules during pregnancy that grow, show up, or, um, or become very evident or become enlarged may have a, more, a higher risk factor for cancer than just generic nodules that show up other times and are not growing quickly. Um, but nodules need to be taken seriously. So, you know, I've, I've heard people say, well, if there's a 95% chance it's benign, why should I bother following up on it? And uh, I said, you know, I really think people need to take it seriously and follow up. And that means that you really are going to need to see an endocrinologist. And the endocrinologist is going to look at the nodule, and uh, they usually are going to do some sort of visualization uh, using imaging tools. So they may start out with an ultrasound. And in some cases, an ultrasound alone can show them that the nodule is not suspicious or not of concern. A lot of times when, when they find a nodule that is very small or incidental as they would refer to it, they would just say, look, we'll just monitor it. So every six months or a year we're going to do an ultrasound just to see what's going on with it. In other cases, if a nodule looks suspicious, they may go ahead and do a CAT scan or they might do a radioactive iodine uptake test because what they're looking at there is whether or not the nodule is cold or hot. A hot nodule or a warm nodule is a nodule that if you take radioactive iodine, the nodule absorbs that radioactive iodine. So it shows up on 
the, uh, the, the x-ray. But a cold nodule is a nodule that will not uptake the iodine. And cold nodules are more likely to be cancerous. So sometimes they will go ahead and do that test as well. If there's a nodule that's extremely suspicious or that shows up as cold or un inconclusive on these tests, then the next step is a fine needle aspiration biopsy, where they actually insert a needle into the, uh, the uh, nodule and they're able to take a look at it uh, from a pathological standpoint to rule in or rule out thyroid cancer. And uh, one of the really exciting parts of the, uh, the latest development really on thyroid nodule analysis is it used to be about 20% of the results were inconclusive. So, you know, 80% of the people who would get a uh, fine needle aspiration biopsy would be told it's not cancerous. But 20, and maybe 5% would be told it is cancerous. But 20% would be told, well, you have an indeterminate or an inconclusive nodule. So we don't know if it's cancer or not. So what they would do then is take out the thyroid gland. You'd have to have surgery to remove your thyroid. Well, now there's a new test that's just come out in the last year, and it's called the Affirma Thyroid Analysis. And there's a company called Verisite that makes that available through doctors. And that test eliminates the inconclusive or indeterminate nodules. So people will get a conclusive result from their test. But you have to ask for that particular test. You can't just assume it's going to be done. But that way, uh, they're estimating that 100,000 people a year who would be referred for thyroid surgery could avoid having to have any kind of surgery or uh, and then ultimately losing their thyroid gland and being hypothyroid for life. Uh, for just for a, a nodule that wasn't cancerous. So that's a, a really great new test that's also part of the testing process for uh, thyroid nodules. What? Okay, so give us the name of that test again. <laughs> it's called the Affirma Thyroid Analysis, and it's made by a company called Verisite. Wonderful. I think that's that, that's really good news and yes. sure comforting to a lot of people. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so next question is, um, is it safe to take thyroid medication uh, when you're pregnant or breastfeeding? Um, actually, you know, the interesting thing about thyroid medication is that it's incredibly important to take when you're pregnant. In fact, it's more important to take when you're pregnant than probably any other time in your life. I mean, thyroid medicine is, is crucial for anyone who relies on it, but when you're pregnant, what happens is within a few days of conception, your uh, teeny tiny little fetus is requiring massive in influx of thyroid hormone for its neurological development. And so for the first 13 weeks of your pregnancy, your baby is operating without a thyroid gland. So you are producing thyroid hormone for two. So your thyroid has to increase its size or you have to be able to increase the volume of thyroid hormone circulating your system in order to meet the demands and needs of the baby. So what happens at that point is that um, a lot of women have to do what's called preconception planning with their doctor. So if you have a thyroid condition and you are thinking about getting pregnant, what you want to do is have a plan with your doctor so that right from the start you can uh, know that the minute you confirm your pregnancy and you want to be testing like eight, nine days post conception to confirm that pregnancy, you're going to up your dose. And the uh, recent studies have shown that most women need to go up by about 50% during that first trimester. So it's very important. If the baby doesn't get enough thyroid hormone, you can have um, developmental delays, cognitive developmental problems, IQ. Uh, can be affected negatively. So there's a lot of uh, issues that can really affect the baby. And in extreme cases, you can uh, lose the baby through a miscarriage. And in, in third world countries where there is a severe iodine deficiency, there are a lot of women that are profoundly hypothyroid walking around. And when they get pregnant and they don't have enough iodine, therefore they don't make enough thyroid hormone, uh, they're giving birth to babies that are known as cretins. It's a condition known as cretinism. And this is the leading preventable cause of mental retardation around the world. So it's a really crucial issue for women to be properly diagnosed, properly medicated, and properly on top of this when they're pregnant and they have a thyroid condition. 
uh, breastfeeding. It's safe to take your thyroid hormone replacement medication while breastfeeding. You just want to be monitoring to make sure you're not over medicated because if you're over medicated there's a slight possibility that some of the medication could pass through the breast milk to the baby. But if you're being medicated at a safe and appropriate dose for you then there's no reason that a woman with hypothyroidism who's being properly treated and properly monitored by her doctor can't safely breastfeed her baby. So earlier we talked about um, the TSH test and that's kind of the more common test that a traditional doctor would, uh, would ask for. So what does the TSH test measure? The TSH test is measuring this pituitary hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone and what it is, is it's, it's a little bit like a thermostat process or a, a, a self-regulating process. When the pituitary detects that there is too much thyroid hormone floating around in your bloodstream, the pituitary releases this TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Uh, well, actually, it, it, it doesn't release TSH. It actually cuts back on the production of TSH because it's trying to tell the thyroid gland, slow down, don't produce so much, because TSH goes to the thyroid, and when the TSH goes to the thyroid, it says make more thyroid hormone. So when the pituitary detects too much hormone, it cuts back on production of TSH. Uh, the opposite issue is when it t detects that there's not enough thyroid hormone circulating in the bloodstream, it sends out more TSH, to go to the thyroid and deliver the message, make more hormone. So people sometimes say, I have high thyroid, low thyroid, high TSH, low, th low TSH. They get confused. And the issue is the higher the TSH, the more the pituitary is screaming at the thyroid saying, make more, make more. So that's associated with hypothyroid. So the lower functioning your thyroid is, the higher the TSH will go because the pituitary is screaming at the thyroid to, to listen and make more hormone. Then the people, when, when you have a very low TSH, that means the thyroid is saying, wait a minute, we don't need to produce any more because she's got enough or he's got enough thyroid hormone. So it shuts down the production and becomes very low uh, to allow the thyroid to slow down production. So the TSH is this messenger hormone that's delivering information between the pituitary gland and to the thyroid gland based on what it's picking up from the blood levels in the bloodstream. But there's a lot of controversy over whether that's enough. Mm -hmm. The conventional endocrinology world thinks this test is the end-all be-all, you know, they say it's all that in a bag of chips. It's, it's everything, it's the gold standard, that all, it's the only test you need, but again, the integrative a medical world, a lot of the hormone balance experts and the folks that are really delving into thyroid and hormone balance think that the TSH test, while one piece of the puzzle is not the complete puzzle and that the other tests like the free T4, free T3, antibodies and reverse T3 are also part of the picture. So that leads to the next question is what do the free T4 and free T3 tests measure? Well, the uh, T4 is, is thyroxin. That is the storage form of the thyroid hormone. And the thyroid produces two key hormones. It produces thyroxin and it produces triiodothyronine. And what those two uh, hormones refer to are the number of iodine molecules on the atom. So thyroxin is T4 because it has four molecules on it. And the uh, T3 is uh, got three iodine molecules. So, but the T4 is the stored form, the T3 is the active form. So the T4 has to go through a process of losing one of its iodine atoms, a process called monodeiodination, or in simple terms, T4 to T3 conversion in order to <laughs> become T3, which is the active hormone at the cellular level. So you can have total T4 measured or you can have free T4 measured. Total T4 is going to measure the total amount of circulating T4 in the bloodstream, but some of that T4 is going to be bound to proteins and unusable by the body. So that's why a lot of the practitioners prefer to measure free T4 because that's the available unbound amount of T4 that's circulating in the bloodstream. Now free T3 
is measuring the T3, which is that uh, key active hormone that's circulating in the bloodstream. And again, rather than total T3, which is the total amount circulating bound to proteins and not, we want to measure the free T3, which is the unbound, free, and available aspect of the, the T3. So um, you mentioned earlier about the reverse T3. So um, what is the reverse T3 measure? Well, what happens is, you know, we talked about the process that the free T4 and free T3 are the two key hormones that are manufactured by the thyroid, and the T4 has to be converted into T3 in order to be used by the thyroid uh, by the cells. Uh, to get the thyroid hormone into the cells to deliver oxygen and energy. But sometimes when we're in periods of extreme or chronic stress or when we have illness or when we have nutritional deficiencies, the thyroid uh, hormone, the T4, instead of converting into T3, converts into an inactive and useless form of T3, which is known as reverse T3. So that free T3 test that we're taking that picks up on the total circulating T3 levels, it is also going to be reflecting this placeholder reverse T3. So while we, our free T3 levels may look good, getting the reverse T3 test can help give us an additional sense of what's going on because if we're making a lot of this reverse T3, that means that a lot of that T3 hormone that's circulating in our bloodstream can't do anything it's kind of a sham and it's taken up space in our bloodstream but it's not doing anything it can't deliver that oxygen and energy so that's where p measuring that reverse T3 helps us really get a sense of what's going on and it's also a marker in some people for extreme physical or emotional stress or adrenal uh, fatigue or adrenal imbalances as well Wow. so you also mentioned the thyroid peroxidase antibody test? Yes. Did I say that right? <laughs> yes. yes, good job. Can you talk about what that test uh, is and what it does, what it measures? Sure. The thyroid peroxidase antibodies, or it's often abbreviated as TPO, or sometimes people were, will refer to it as the anti-TPO or, or TPO antibodies. This is a test that's measuring a particular antibody that the thyroid gland produces that uh, attacks the, the gland. So the gland is producing, uh, the body is producing these horm these uh, antibodies, not hormones, mm -hmm. that attack the thyroid gland and make the thyroid gland incapable of producing its own hormones. It slows it down, it atrophies the gland, it chips away at the gland's capability of functioning, and eventually it can slow it down or even disable the gland entirely, atrophy it, and make it completely non-functional. So when we're measuring the TPO antibodies, we're looking for signs that this autoimmune Hashimoto's disease is present in the person. And even at the earliest stages when the antibodies start to go up but the other levels seem to appear normal, there's some evidence according to some studies that treating those patients may help stall the increase in antibodies or even revert them back to a more normal status and certainly may prevent the progression of the uh, hypothyroidism to overt levels where people are extremely symptomatic. The other um, issue is that some people, even if their thyroid levels are completely normal, they may have uh, elevated antibodies and that can cause a whole uh, host of symptoms. So for some people, uh, there's some endocrinologists and some hormone experts who will go with low dose thyroid treatment for patients who have high antibodies but otherwise normal or what's referred to as euthyroid levels uh, because those people may benefit from treatment. Wonderful. Okay, last question. Can you believe we, uh, we've we been doing a lot of uh, wonderful information and I see here it says are you at the right TSH level? So I guess that's just a, a question that people uh, ask whether you are personally at the right TSH yes. level. <laughs> Well, no, they're not asking me, although people always want to know what, what are you taking and what's your TSH, et cetera. Exactly. And, um, you know, what I tell people is the right TSH level for you is the level where you feel well safely. Um, and it's my same philosophy about thyroid medication. The best thyroid medicine is the one that safely works best for you. Uh, but TSH is a, it's a little bit of a complicated and it's certainly a controversial topic because the normal range for TSH, so this is the reference range that most laboratories are using, 
is around 0.3 or 0.4 on the bottom end to about 4.5 up to around 6.0 on the top end. So the bottom end range is the cutoff for hyperthyroidism, so to speak, and the top end of the range is the cutoff for hypothyroidism, so to speak. So that does not mean that you know, if you're a 0.2, you're hyperthyroid, or if you're a, a, a 6.1, you're absolutely hypothyroid. Um, but certainly those are the cutoff points according to the most conventional and broad laboratory standards. But about 10 years ago, the clinical laboratory guideline folks and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists came out with some new guidelines and said, no, this range is far too broad because it's missing a lot of people who have developing Hashimoto's disease or who are high end of the normal range and they are uh, failing. You know, they actually have some sort of thyroid failure in progress and we're capturing them all and we shouldn't be. So they wanted to change the range to 0.3 to 3.0. And that went, that discussion and debate and, you know, war basically has been going on for about 10 years. And if that happened, an additional 20 to 30 million people would conceivably fall into the category of being mildly hypothyroid or borderline or what's known as subclinical hypothyroidism because they would fall into that limbo land of 3.0 to 6.0. But then again recently the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists came out again and now they're saying no we think it's 4.5 that should be the top end. Uh, and, and, but really unless you hit a 10 you really don't have a problem. So they have turned upside down, inside out, and, and now so it's even more confusing than ever before. So what I like to do is talk to the integrative doctors in the field and find out what they really think. And what they're saying is TSH levels above about 2.5 may be indicative of a slight slowdown in the thyroid, and levels above 6 they consider hypothyroid. Um, levels on the bottom end, if it's below a 0.1, they start to look at hyperthyroidism, um, but levels between 0.1 and 0.3, it depends on the treatment or if somebody's on medication or what the other issues, the antibodies, uptake tests, etc., are showing. Uh, so they have a little bit more latitude on the low end and the high end. Um, and certainly, again, the integrative doctors are not using just the TSH test as well uh, to gauge things. Now, of course, this TSH range is different for women in pregnancy. If you're pregnant, the range does tighten up and it narrows substantially and most uh, doctors would not want your TSH to go above about a 2.5 during pregnancy and there are very specific guidelines for each trimester of pregnancy, trimester 1, trimester 2, and trimester 3. So what we want to do is keep track of where those thyroid levels are during the pregnancy, at, but keep in mind a lot of obstetricians don't know about these guidelines and a lot of endocrinologists don't know about pregnancy. So I always encourage thyroid patients to check in with me. I've got resources and books and, and information and guidelines information about those particular uh, target TSH levels during pregnancy so that you can make sure you're up on the latest standards because they change a lot and they're getting tighter and tighter at least on pregnancy for women so we know that women who are pregnant need to be really on top of these kinds of numbers. Um, so the TSH test in general, uh, you know, it, 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 it can be helpful as a first level screen for the for a big cross section of the population. So if you come in with a TSH of 20, you know, there's no question. Nobody's going to debate whether you're hypothyroid. So as a front line screening, it can be helpful, but it is not a standalone screen because it's going to miss a lot of those folks who are in that limbo and it's also going to miss those folks who have completely normal uh, circulating hormone levels but who have elevated antibodies that show that they have Hashimoto's disease. So I don't like to say to people, hey, if you have a TSH test and it comes back normal, you're fine because that does not reflect the, re the reality of the situation for people. 
Right. Well, I, I think that leads to, I'm going to ask my own question because I think sure. this is good to uh, end. So when people go, and we'll, again, we will point a link to where you can go and order these tests through my med lab. And, um, and there is an opportunity uh, once you get the results. And that, that's the question is, you know, how, how do you determine if you're going through and ordering your test, how do, how do you get to understand the results? Well, I mean, there's a number of different things that you can do. First of all, we've got information uh, that's available through my med lab about uh, some of the information on how to interpret your results and what some of the uh, different levels may mean. Uh, certainly, if they're flagged as abnormal, that's going to be something that people need to pay very close attention to. Uh, through my med lab, people have the option to order a uh, consultation with me. Uh, so they can get on the phone with me for 15 minutes and I'll just fast forward them through the results quickly and help them kind of understand what questions to ask their doctor and what sorts of information they want to have on hand to take the next steps and make some decisions. Uh, they can come into the uh, various forums uh, that we've set up. They can look at other questions on our live FAQ or on our uh, online systems at my med lab where we've got all sorts of questions answered, the common questions that a lot of people have. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that people can get that information. I also have uh, a number of books that focus in on the in-depth treatment of hypothyroidism, Graves' disease, hyperthyroidism. So it, it will help people understand what to do with those tests once you've got them. Because having them in hand and even understanding them is a, a crucial first step, but then you've got to take those results and go out and do something with them. You've got to get in touch with the practitioners or the doctors or uh, make decisions about self-care or other types of issues. And so really what you want to do is be very informed and an, be an empowered patient and get as much uh, information, knowledge, connections as you can so that you can, you can really go out there with your information fully armed to move forward and live healthy and live well. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Mary, for joining us. And I know people will have tons of questions, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask additional questions. If you're on livefaq.com, you'll see the button, or on Thyroid Hub, you'll see the button to ask an additional question. Uh, and I'll post the link at the in the end of this description as well, so you can, you know, I know Mary's going to need to come back again and again and again <laughs> to answer more questions. So thank you so much for joining us, Mary. I appreciate it. Thank you, Cheryl. All right. Bye-bye.